This next session, I think we've been looking forward to for some time now. Uh, Rick and I met many months ago and had planned out this concept, and I'm so pleased to see it now coming together because both Rick and Keith are going to walk through a mock negotiation. They're going to endeavor to cover three different issues in an M&A transaction, and this really hits to the spirit of what we're doing with transaction advisors is to understand and uncover the best practice in putting deals together, and collectively, I think we can advance the practice of, of better, more strategic, more thoughtful negotiations, better deals, um, and certainly this will hit right on the uh, right, right home in terms of that ambition. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to, Re to Rick and Keith, who are gonna lead this next session. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you, William. Um, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Uh, so my name is Rick Kleiman. Uh, I'm joined this afternoon by my Hogan Lovells colleague, uh, Keith Blau, uh, I'm somewhat embarrassed uh, to admit on behalf of both of us uh, that uh, between the two of us, we have more than six decades of collective <laughs> M&A experience. And it's- Five? No. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's depressing to, uh, to even say that. Um, uh, but our focus today, as William suggested, is gonna be on negotiating M&A deals, and in particular, negotiating certain purchase price formulations that I'm guessing many of you in the audience uh, have dealt with before. And also, <coughs> time permitting, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we're gonna address uh, a growing and at times uh, annoying trend that has emerged in the negotiation of key provisions in the acquisition agreement. Um, and that is the reliance, and I would almost say blind reliance, on these now widely pro proliferated deal point studies that many of you have seen. These are statistical surveys that purport to tell practitioners what so-called market terms are uh, in a deal. And uh, we'll, we'll close with that because we have some uh, interesting and somewhat caustic observations on, uh, on that. Uh, but today we're gonna illustrate for you some of the give and take that goes on in negotiating the purchase price formulations that we're gonna be talking about today. And to do that, we're gonna slip into character uh, with uh, me on the buy side and Keith on the sell side. I'm going to play the role of the lawyer for a publicly traded buyer. I know many of you are affiliated with publicly traded companies. Uh, in this case, a serial tech acquirer. And uh, that has its sights set on a target company, uh, a technology company represented by Keith. And for most purposes today, we can assume that the target company, Keith's client, uh, is a privately held company. And again, this is a scenario that should be familiar to many of you. You should all have in front of you the materials for today's uh, presentation. There's a little stack here at the front of the room if you haven't received one, but they should have been passed out. Uh, please keep them close at hand because we're gonna refer to them periodically. Uh, and of course, uh, feel free to interrupt at any time uh, with questions uh, if you have any. Uh, during this uh, uh, session. So um, we're gonna begin uh, by talking about acquisition currency and the, the type of deal consideration that's used by the buyer to pay for the deal. And as most of you know, uh, the basic choices here are hold, cold hard cash, number one, and number two, shares of the buyer stock, or some combination of those two. Now, um, the first chart in the materials behind, you know, what we'll call virtual tab one, because they're not uh, really tabs, but just uh, sheets of paper marked tab one, uh, uh, you know, identifies some of the factors and considerations uh, you have to take into account in determining what type of acquisition currency to use. And let's assume as we move into character uh, that the buyer and the target company have already reached some sort of basic agreement on valuation. So let's have at it, Keith. Uh, you know, we've agreed that the company you're representing, the target company, is worth a cool $300 million. And because your client, the target company, has uh, 10 million shares outstanding, that comes out to a price of $30 a share, right? Uh, that's right, Rick. Uh, what our clients have decided is a price of $30 a share. That's exactly what we want. Yeah. Now, does your client actually have a preference? as to whether it would want to receive that $30 a share in stock or cash, uh, what would it prefer? Yeah, so it prefers uh, stock. Uh, our founders have a very low basis in their shares, 
and they really don't want to pay tax this year. They want to decide when they pay tax, so they'd prefer stock so they can get a tax-free uh, deal. Right. Recognize that one of the key advantages of, uh, of a stock swap over a pure cash acquisition is the ability to, to, to do the acquisition on a tax-free, actually a tax-deferred basis. But I'll tell you, Keith, uh, that I, we understand your desire uh, for, uh, for stock consideration in this case. Uh, and I will tell you that our bankers and our corporate development folks are not wild about us using our stock as acquisition currency because uh, a stock deal is simply going to be much less accretive to our earnings per share than a cash deal. And the investment bankers in the audience will tell you uh, that that's because the cost of equity capital in the current market and generally almost in all markets uh, is uh, materially higher than the cost of debt capital uh, in the marketplace. And uh, so. Uh, as we show on the chart here, a stock for stock deal is going to be less accretive for the buyer's EPS than a, uh, um, uh, than a cash deal. But on the other hand, I will say that my client is not sitting on a ton of domestic cash right now. Uh, my client has a lot of cash on its consolidated balance sheet, uh, but it, it's all tied up in Europe. And I might feel differently if President Trump would actually come through uh, on uh, mm -hmm. that repatriation tax holiday that he's been uh, talking about. But we're a little cash starved domestically now, and given our capital structure and our current debt load, uh, we're not really interested in borrowing money to, fi to finance this deal. Um, so, so thanks for all that background. So I guess you're okay then issuing stock. Yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to do a straight stock swap here, uh, what we refer to as a stock for stock deal. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, the deal price will be paid entirely in shares of my client's stock. Uh, but I need you to bear in mind uh, that to issue those shares to your client's shareholders, uh, my client, the buyer, is going to have to rely on an exemption from the securities laws because shares of stock are securities after all. We all know that securities have to be registered with the SEC unless there's an exemption available. And uh, the exemption that we're probably going to rely on is going to require those shares to be locked up for a little while. And uh, your shareholder, they won't be purely liquid in your shareholders' uh, hands. Uh, are they going to be okay with that? Well, well, they will, but really it uh, depends on what exemption you think about. For Regulation D, you're right, there's a six-month lockup and the client's fine with that, but there are other exemptions that we should talk about that don't require a lockup, like a 3A10 fairness hearing, which would get us liquid shares. But for the time being, we'll accept these shares that are, that are locked up for six months. We might want to talk about registration rights, but let's leave that to the side for now. now because my client's shareholders will be getting a big chunk of your client's equity, we'll want to do some type of due diligence on your client, just like your client is doing due diligence on mine. We'll want to get the same types of representations and warranties from your client that you're getting from us, because after all, we're making an investment in your client, we're getting your shares. And as a general matter, we'll want some pretty good symmetry in the acquisition agreement. So again, we'll want symmetry in rep, symmetry in covenants and the like. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I just have to tell you now, that's just not gonna happen. This is not a merger of equals. Uh, your client is a much smaller company than my client is. Uh, by my calculation, your client's shareholders are gonna end up owning maybe 10%, uh, may, maybe approaching 15% of the outstanding stock of the combined company. Uh, when this whole transaction comes down, so uh, forget about symmetry. Well, I don't know, 10 to 15% is a pretty big chunk. We'll certainly want to start with talking about due diligence, and we'll at least want to talk about your forecast to see what's coming down the pike since we will be locked up. Okay, well, that kind of constrained due diligence may be okay, but remember, we're going to be doing you know, the mother of all due diligence investigations on your company. We're going to look at all of your IP. We're going to look at uh, you know, uh, you know, all of your employment uh, arrangements, all of your licenses, all of your contracts, your disputes, your litigation. You're we're going to be combing through everything. I hope that's making you a little uncomfortable. It, it is making me uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, you know, but uh, um, if you want to do some high-level due diligence and uh, you know, uh, under a mutual confidentiality agreement, of course, uh, we're happy to tell you about the quality of our consideration and what our earnings are going to. Well, we'll uh, talk about the at. level of due diligence, and okay. we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, but let's okay. talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about the exchange ratio. Uh, well, uh, you know. Uh, you know, why is that the elephant in the room? It's, 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 it's pretty simple, really, the way I look at it. The price we've agreed on is $30 a share, correct? And you know that my clients, the buyer's stock price, has been hovering around $15 per share. Uh, so 
we're going to agree on an exchange ratio, a fixed exchange ratio of two shares of my client stock, that's $15 a share, for every outstanding share of your client stock. That's a two to one exchange ratio, uh, two times 15 equals 30, right? Uh, this is simple stuff. You don't need a PhD in higher mathematics to figure this out, a, t a, a two for one exchange ratio. Yeah, that is, that is simple math, Rick, but you miss sort of a major issue. There's gonna be a long period of time or potentially a long period of time between the, the signing of the deal and the closing of the deal. And the stock's gonna fluctuate in that time period. If you use a two for one, the value then is gonna fluctuate. We don't wanna be uh, subject to that huge value fluctuation. We want $300 million. We don't want two shares per stock. So again, above my head here, in your exchange ratio, if your stock is here at 15, sure, it's 300 million. But if your stock goes down here, guess what? It's only a $100 million deal, and that's not going to work You're, for you're actually worried about our stock going down from $15 to $5 a share in the relatively short time between signing and closing? We don't know how long it's going to be, and it could do that. And again, my clients are focused on the $300 million. So we'd like a fixed value deal, a floating exchange ratio deal. Yeah, those of you who are mathematically inclined and familiar with asymptotes will be... Uh, 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 will be comfortable with this. So what you're saying is you want a, a deal where the exchange ratio actually changes so that if we are at $15 a share, uh, yes, uh, we're, well, we're, we're, we're talking about Well, what I want is a deal that gets one. me $300 million. So this right. is the deal that I want. So, so in effect, if our stock price did go down to $5 a share, uh, you would be saying uh, you want the exchange ratio to adjust automatically to 6 to 1 from 2 to 1. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty extreme ask, uh, uh, I, I, I would say. Uh, and I, I would also tell you, uh, Keith, uh, that I think you're looking at the wrong end of these diagrams. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've talked about the, the tremendous revenue and cost synergies and uh, that this deal is going to generate. Tremendous. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're both elated about uh, uh, this deal and how this is going to be a great deal for all parties. And I think we all know that uh, my client's stock, the buyer stock, is going to rise well above $15 a share, maybe up to $20 or $25 a share because of this deal, because of the synergies generated by this deal, and the street is going to think it's a wonderful uh, deal here. Well, good, so then you th so that your, your, your stock is, is, is going to be you know, uh, worth like $400 or $500 million in, I, I love hearing that. Then you shouldn't be worried about a floating exchange ratio because you're so sure the stock is going to go up, you'll issue more shares, my client will be happy because it'll get us well, $300 well, million. Yeah, dollars yeah we'll issue less shares and, uh, and, and your client will be happy. Yeah, uh, but, but look, here's the problem with the floating exchange ratio, and uh, this is why you'll rarely see a floating exchange ratio other than in the elephant and the flea situation. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, if GE uh, is, is buying some, you know, uh, tiny little publicly traded company, maybe it can, uh, you know, do a pure floating exchange ratio. But the problem with a floating exchange ratio is that if my stock does go down a little bit, the number of shares that, uh, you know, that I have to issue, uh, you know, goes up significantly. And if it goes up high enough, uh, it may actually, you know, in other words, if instead of owning only 10 per to 15 percent of the outstanding combined company uh, shares, uh, you know, your former shareholders ending, end up owning uh, 17 percent or 18 percent, uh, we'll actually have to have a shareholder vote on our end. And nobody wants that. That's going to create uncertainty for the deal. Uh, you're not, you're, you're going to want an even higher price because of the uncertainty that my shareholders might vote this deal down. It, it opens up a can of worms that none of us wants. Now, uh, I, I could see uh, doing a floating exchange ratio like this if we collar it. And we've shown in the diagrams what a collared floating exchange ratio would look like. Uh, again, for those mathematically inclined, at least it will cap uh, you know, th th there, will, there will be some maximum level of dilution. I'll know that under no circumstances will my client have to issue more than a certain uh, number of shares. And I commend to you, particularly those of you uh, um, that are uh, in part of the number crunching game, if you've never gone through this exercise before, you know, the numbers are up there, the charts are up there, um, you know, but, uh, uh, but this, is a, you know, this is a real issue for us. Now, uh, let's step out of character very, uh, very briefly, uh, um, uh, Keith. This is a major fight in, uh, uh, in a lot of deals. There's no uh, 
question about the fact that fixed exchange ratios are a little more common. Things get a little more complicated if Heath's client is a publicly traded client rather than a privately held client. Uh, why is that so? Because if Heath's uh, client is publicly traded, all of a sudden the arbitrageurs step into the act. And one of the things that the investment bankers in the room will tell you that particularly when you use some of these exotic uh, exchange ratio formulations, uh, the right move for the, arbitra uh, for the arbitrageurs is to uh, take a long position in the target company stock uh, and then short the buyer stock as a hedge, putting downward pressure on the, uh, on the buyer stock price, snapping the collar, and creating problems for everyone. So uh, I, I guess we'll end by saying, uh, as you negotiate this, get a good lawyer and get a good banker uh, to help negotiate uh, the purchase price formulation and the exchange ratio uh, um, formulation. Uh, anything else in the way of uh, just uh, out of the uh, um, sort of uh, out of character commentary on this, Keith? Well, you started with keep it simple. It definitely could get complicated when you start to think about the exchange ratios. Right. Well, speaking of not keeping things simple, uh, we're going to move to our second topic, uh, which is another type of pricing formulation, and that's uh, the earnout. I think most of you in the audience know what an earnout pricing formula is. Uh, by a show of hands, uh, how many of you have actually dealt with earnouts before? Uh, and uh, um, so, uh, um, most of you. Um, simply How many of you had a good experience with our Yeah, ex before? exactly. That's a, that's uh, a strong just minority, one, right. really. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, actually, <laughs> that's uh, right. afterwards, uh, and to provide some testimonials, uh, um, because uh, most advisors uh, hate earnouts because of their complexity, or love them because of their complexity and uh, uh, all the extra input they get to provide. But, uh, simply put, for the few of you that may not know what an earnout is, it's a mechanism that allows all or part of the purchase price to be paid after the closing of the acquisition based on the post-closing performance of the business that's actually being sold. Uh, and you'll find a helpful discussion of earnouts behind tab three of our materials. And slipping back into character, let's assume that Keith and I, unlike the previous vignette, have not agreed on the valuation. Uh, of uh, his client, the target company. And in fact, we vehemently disagree on valuation. So the decision uh, to utilize an earnout formulation can play out, I guess, something like this. So Keith, um, you really think your client, this target company, this technology company that you're representing, uh, is worth $300 million? I do. Uh, just look at the two-year cash flow and earnings projections. The company is easily worth $300 million. Well, I, I got to tell you, Keith, we've studied your client's projections and, and we're, well, let's just say we're a little bit skeptical uh, about the numbers you've shown us and, and the underlying assumptions that went into generating those numbers. Uh, so we've given your numbers a reasonable haircut uh, to bring them back into the zone of reality. And uh, when we look at the adjusted numbers, uh, we can only get to a valuation of 200 million, not even close to the $300 million that your client is insisting on. Well, and I guess we're gonna have to find a buyer that uh, feels better about our projections and we'll, uh, we'll see you later. We'll find one that likes the $300 million. Okay, Good luck with that, uh, um, because every buyer um, is gonna take a look at them with the same skeptical eye that we will, and they're gonna get, uh, they're, they're, you're gonna have to take a haircut on those numbers. But I will tell you what we're gonna do, because you seem so passionate and you know, uh, so intent on getting that $300 million, so confident in these numbers, uh, we're gonna ask you to put your money where your mouth is. And that's what an earnout is. It's the classic put your money where your mouth is formulation. Uh, we're gonna use an earnout pricing formulation. We'll pay your client stockholders $200 million at the closing of the deal. Uh, but if the performance of the target company's business after the closing warrants it, uh, your client's shareholders can receive up to an additional $100 million, uh, bringing the total price up to the $300 million uh, you're so stubbornly insisting on. Uh, and uh, specifically, uh, if the business hits your one-year EBITDA bogey, your net cash flow target of $10 million in the first year after the closing, we will pay your client's former shareholders, then former shareholders, obviously, uh, an additional 50 million. And same arrangement for year two. If the business hits your year two EBITDA bogey, uh, which is 12 million and the projections you showed us, the very aggressive projections you showed us, but you seem to believe them, 
uh, you know, we'll pay your former shareholders yet another $50 million. In other words, make your numbers and you will hit your $300 million purchase price target. I only ask one thing, and you alluded to it just earlier, keep it simple, just as I described it. You keep talking about keeping things simple and then you add just a ton of complexities. You want an EBITDA-based earnout, a cash flow-based earnout. That's way too complex, Rick, because then you have to start thinking about the charges and the expenses. And I'd rather use something that's measurable and that doesn't have the potential for ma manipulation like the expenses do. So let's maybe talk about a revenue-based earnout, and then maybe my client will agree to it. Yeah, see, well, the problem with that uh, is that's a little too simple, Keith. Uh, you know, I do agree that a top-line metric like revenues is simpler to measure and implement than a bottom-line metric like earnings or EBITDA or straight cash flow, et cetera. But the problem with using revenues as a metric is that it doesn't really align incentives. And the management team for the business going forward, which are your, you know, your client's former stockholders, uh, are going to be incented to deliver a lot of flimsy revenues, a lot of unprofitable revenues, a lot of slim margin revenues uh, you know, to the company in order to meet whatever revenue bogey is set. Uh, that's the way people act. That's human nature. They respond to incentives. That's not what we want. We want a healthy bottom line. Uh, so yeah, I agree it would be simpler, but it would be stupid uh, from our standpoint. Um, well, again, if you want to keep it simple, we need to talk about revenue. If you want to make it more complex, we can talk about doing a cash flow based on out, but there are going to be a host of issues that we need to talk about. In fact, I put together a whole slide presentation on just those very issues. So if you look at the next slide, the first question at the bottom of the slide is what revenues count? Before we even get to the expense side, what revenues count? Is it going to be limited to specific products that, we're, that my client is currently selling? If so, I worry about that. Because what if you take our technology and you put it into a new product and you call it something else, you can design around it. So what revenue counts is going to be critical. Yeah, but suppose we take a little tiny bit of your technology and drop it in there. Should you get full earn out credit for that? I mean, We should, but we're going to negotiate that. So it's not going to be simple. If you go to the next slide. How should revenues be allocated if the product's sold in a bundle? It's super nice. If you have a product, you sell it one way, there's a list price and everybody knows. What if you sell it in a bundle? Who's going to allocate the price in that bundle? And then what happens if your client uses my client's fantastic product as a loss leader? It gives it away so it could sell some of your existing products. I need to get credit for all of those things. Yeah, that is going to be complicated because that would be a problem even if we had a top line based earn That's out. That's right. Yeah. And we're yeah. only on slide whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Keep flipping a couple more slides forward. So what costs count? There you go. Now we got to talk about, we've got the revenue side. What costs are deducted in order to sort of measure the metric? It's easy when I'm a standalone company and I can control my costs. Once I'm a part of GE or whatever large company, how are costs going to be allocated? And so we're going to have to spend a lot of time negotiating that point. Keep flipping. Nah. Two more slides. So let's skip the measurement period. We'll talk about that. Operational issues. There's a whole host of issues here. If you look at uh, one, one question I'm going to have is, go back one. Go back one. Just from the beginning, the second bullet Will the key employees that have been running this company that know how to sell these products and generate revenue, are they going to remain in control of the target? And if so, for how long? And by the way, I want to put that in the agreement to make sure that this team continues to run it. And what happens if wait, we- Wait a second. You mean we can't, you know, someone is just really screwing up. We, we, we can't terminate them. We can't fire them. You can terminate them after the earnout period, but you're not going to terminate them early. And if you do, we'll talk about what happens in a minute. Let's go to the next slide. I can't what, wait. Yeah. What general level of efforts is your client going to agree to? I want language in the agreement that says your client is going to make sure that our business is run in a way to maximize the revenue, maximize the EBITDA. So you're not wait, wait, selling. Wait, wait, wait. Isn't that the tail wagging the dog? I mean, no. isn't that you're going you're gonna to tell us how to operate one of our units? Yeah. Absolutely, because I've got $100 million riding on that for sure. You could pay me $300 million now and we'll be done. But if you want to do this 250 and 50, 
then I want to know not only generally, I, I, I want specific promises from your client, because your client has told my client that we're going to be independent, that we're going to be such a great part of this big global company, you're going to invest mightily in our product. Let's just put a specific covenant as to how much you're going to invest, what you're going to invest in, and we're going to be able to use your great distribution channel without cost, by the way. Keep flipping. Two more. One more. Acceleration events. What happens if I'm successful in negotiating all these covenants and your client breaches them? I know they'll never do that, but what if they did? What if they sell the company? They find out it's so great it's worth $500 million, and they sell it the next day. I want to make sure my client gets paid its $100 million. I want these acceleration events. So if your client sells the company, it sells its assets, you said earlier, you want to be able to fire my client? Well, if you do, fine. Then just pay the hundred million dollars. So if you fire them, then the full hundred million accelerates. Yeah. Right, but I mean, and we're going to have to distinguish making it even more complex between firing for cause. You know, if your client's embezzling, uh, uh, you know, if one of these former shareholders is embezzling, uh, you know, we, we should be able to fire them without uh, without accelerating the earnout. Fine, right? I'm glad you agree on the concept. We'll talk about the definition of cause. And I also want to make sure that we talk about the definition of good reason, because it's not just if you fire us, mm -hmm. but my client is a very passionate engineer. He doesn't want to be cleaning the restrooms. So if you assign responsibilities that aren't consistent with that, we get to quit and get that so, so, $100 million. So Keith, uh, I, Should I keep going? No, I, I, I think we're, we're not going to be able to keep this simple, are we? No. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, and let's step out of character here, and this is why I'm interested in hearing from the experience of some of you. Uh, it looks like if we do an earn out, we will have the $100 million tail wagging the $200 million dog. The earn out section of the acquisition agreement uh, is going to be twice as long as the rest of the agreement. We'll see 70 dense pages of accounting definitions and covenants and acceleration events and other complicated and cumbersome provisions that's going to take years. Uh, not months, it's going to take years to negotiate this. And, uh, um, you know, and by the way, out of character, uh, uh, Keith and I had the privilege of negotiating what I think may be the biggest uh, earnout in history. Uh, it was eBay's acquisition of Skype. Uh, um, t talk yeah. about it. So that was, that was crazy, right? So eBay paid $3.9 billion for Skype. That might have been crazy too, but that's a whole separate question because they ultimately got it back on the back end when, when, when it was sold to Microsoft. But uh, $2.5 billion up front and a $1.4 billion earnout. You if can, anyone knows of an earnout of more than $1.4 billion, tell us because uh, we're telling people that this is the largest <laughs> earnout of all time. And even if you told us, we'd still say it. So yeah, tell us right. what we're we'll interested in. Anyway. Um, but the, the definition section went on for two and a half alphabets. We got to like triple R of defined terms. It was 27 pages of definitions. There were three metrics. There was a revenue metric, a profit metric, and an active user metric. Who knows what active users are? Yeah, nor did we. So we had to sort of figure that out and negotiate that and put language in that. Yeah. Then we had all kinds of control issues. And there's a saying, earnouts never earned, always paid. Well, at the end of the day, eBay did decide to pay one of the metrics out of three different metrics, and we kind of went on our way and then sold the company. But, but, but that's one of the reasons that buyers are, are, are sometimes a little wary of earnouts. Uh, never earned, always paid. Because if you get to the end of the earnout period and you're looking, you're still valued employees in the eye and saying, oh, sorry, you missed, you know, <laughs> that $100 million you were counting on? You know, you knew the rules. Uh, you're going to have some pretty upset employees on that. So very often they get settled out and paid out uh, in, uh, in any event. And I would definitely say that because of the complexity, more deals get proposed as earnouts than actually end up getting done as earnouts. Because uh, if the target company has a uh, lawyer as skilled as Keith is uh, at this, uh, it becomes a very convoluted uh, um, process, particularly where the earnout is relatively small relative to the base uh, purchase price. It's just uh, not worth it. And earnouts, in, in our experience, I'd like to hear your experience at some point. Maybe uh, we'll stick around for the break afterwards and would like to, uh, uh, to hear from, uh, um, from some of you about this. Uh, but uh, 
they almost always, it seems, end up in disputes and commonly end up in litigation. And there's a lot of litigation out there about earnouts. Is that what you really want? I mean, they're, they're proposed as a, as a creative way for the business folks to bridge a valuation gap. But usually there's a reason that there's a valuation gap and the earnout doesn't really bridge it at the end and you end up with a fight on your hands. I will say that if some uh, of our buy side clients do go in with it with their eyes open and they know they're going to have to pay either all of it or some of it, but they want to drive a particular behavior, they want to retain people for a certain amount of time, and this arguably gives them an opportunity to do that. Right. Uh, so uh, uh, so that, that's the negotiation that goes on over earnout uh, uh, formulations. They're common in the tech sector, certainly common in the life sciences sector where you have milestone-based earnouts Absolutely. based on regulatory uh, milestones and, uh, and, and, and the like. Uh, but they are challenging. Uh, and as common as they are, be, uh, be aware of the challenges before you, uh, before you go into them. So to conclude our segment uh, today and in an effort to get uh, uh, things uh, back on track, we won't uh, spend too much time on this, uh, let's talk about a negotiating vignette that's become all too familiar in the current M&A marketplace, uh, one that may bring back uh, pen painful memories, I would think, for at least some of you in the, uh, in the audience. So, uh, Keith, um, we've hammered out the price terms now. Mm -hmm. you know, we've agreed on the earnout or the exchange rate or what, whatever. But uh, at this point, why don't we just go through the rest of the draft definitive acquisition agreement and deal with the non-price terms. Uh, you know, as you know, as buyer's counsel, I've sent you our eminently reasonable buyer's first draft. Uh, so hopefully, we're not going to have a lot to talk about here and we'll be able to sl slide through this, sail through it fairly easily. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Rick, we do have a lot to talk about. Uh, uh, and why is that? Well, I've compared your draft agreement, this reasonable buyer's draft agreement, to a recent American Bar Association private target deal point study. And compared to the ABA study, you are way, way off market. Okay, so there it is. Um, that's it. Uh, the biggest insult that can be delivered in the current M&A marketplace. You're off market. Um, no way off market. <laughs> you know, Keith, you know, please tell me I'm mean. Please tell me I'm incompetent. Tell me I'm clumsy. Uh, but whatever you do, please don't say I'm off market. Because that is, uh, how many of you have, uh, you know, have heard, that, oh, not a market deal, off market. How, how many of you have been confronted by people that are citing deal point studies in, in one way or another? Just by show of hands, I'd be interesting. It, it, it is something that is becoming uh, not only uh, commonplace, but almost ubiquitous in, in the current negotiating scene. So, um, Keith, give me an example uh, of uh, where we're off market, uh, according to this ABA study. Yes, so I will give you an example. We've negotiated 28 pages of representations and warranties covering the waterfront, litigation, employees, taxes, and then at the very end, you've added what's called a full disclosure rep that says, in addition to those 28 pages of reps and warranties, there's nothing else that's material that you forgot to tell me. You rarely see that, according to my ABA study. Well, it's in all of our deals. I mean, we get that all the time. Uh, uh, but, but all right, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, you're going to have to tell me about this, uh, this ABA study, you know, that purports to measure what's market and that says you never get a full disclosure or so-called 10B5 representation is just one example. Uh, of uh, um, you know one, one of the uh, deal points that yeah. you're objecting to. No, it's a great study. The American Bar Association put together a bunch of lawyers from a lot of different firms, looked at a number of deal points, reps and warranties, closing conditions, indemnification provisions, how long the IP rep lasts and the like, and they put together a study that told my client what's market. It's phenomenal. And, and just what is the sample set for this? Study? Oh, the sample set is unassailable because we're not talking about deals that I just pulled from the cabinet. These are publicly filed deals. These are deals that are filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission so all of us can go and look at them and see how these statistics come out. Yeah, so, so let, let me follow up on that for a second. Doesn't that mean that all of the deals that my client does and all the deals that are done by companies similar in size to my client, you know, my client, uh, you know, has uh, a market cap well above $100 billion. Think Oracle, Intel, Google, Amazon, GE, whatever. Uh, 
um, you know, um, doesn't it mean that all the companies done by uh, my client aren't going to be in this study? Well, you know, I guess that's right, but you know, it's the best study that we have. You know, it's it's the ABA study. It's well, but, but, but but just let me follow up on that. Uh, um, for when when my client does a three hundred million dollar deal, it's a rounding error. Um, and that's not a material deal from my client's standpoint. Because it's not a material deal, uh, my client doesn't even have to publicly announce it, uh, but it certainly doesn't have to file the deal documents with the SEC on an 8K. Uh, so this study uh, only covers deals, you've just said, that get filed with the SEC. Therefore, the results of this study that you're citing and that are being cited so often in negotiations today is a flawed study. The results are skewed. It only includes the deals done by smaller buyers where the SEC materiality standard is satisfied because a $300 million deal, for example, mm -hmm. is always going to be material uh, to a buyer with a $1 billion market cap. It just won't be material to a buyer with a $100 billion market cap. Uh, so, so I, so I I guess you're right, some of those deals aren't filed, but it's still None tracks. of those deals are filed. Yeah. Yeah. It still tracks publicly filed deals. Yeah, well, it tracks publicly filed deals, uh, but the fact of the matter is that the deals that are excluded from that study, that's the market my client is playing in. It's not playing in this market, uh, uh, you know, it, it's playing in the market uh, where serial acquirers with big market caps are going out and buying uh, companies, and you would expect uh, that serial acquirers with big market caps uh, have a little bit more negotiating leverage than these small, tiny publicly traded companies that, uh, you know, that buy the companies uh, in the deals that are covered by that study. Wouldn't you agree? Well, so I, I get the point. Deals done by bigger buyers aren't included in the survey. But how do we even know what the terms are that those bigger buyers get? I'm certainly not going to go ask those bigger buyers about that. Well, I know. I, I know anecdotally that the bigger buyers get better Oh, so I should trust than you? The, than the smaller buyers surveyed in the, a, in the ABA Okay, so I, sh I should take your word on that. Yeah, because I've seen <laughs> them. Uh, but, but you really don't have to take my word for it, because I've included in the materials uh, some excerpts from a brand new study. Call this the antidote to this nonsense <laughs> that's been going on and proliferating throughout the negotiating. Uh, you know, so new in fact that it hasn't even been officially issued yet. It's marked draft and uh, uh, you should respect it uh, as a draft that way. It's behind uh, tab four, just this one expert. Uh, so what I've included is a very advanced draft of the study, good enough to circulate, it, uh, to, circulate to all of you here. Um, it's a joint effort uh, by the ABA and SRS Aquiam. Uh, there are some SRS Aquiam representatives in the, uh, in the audience here, and this audience has the honor of uh, uh, seeing a preview. And this study uh, is really done for those of you who are affiliated with or who regularly advise, in the case of the advisors in the room, large cap buyers. Uh, and this is a tool that you can actually use, a godsend, really, something to throw in the face of the obnoxious sell-side lawyers uh, who robotically cite these skewed uh, market statistics to support their distorted negotiating positions that are incredibly frustrating. So uh, let's look at the, at the uh, excerpt that we've included because it happens to address this full disclosure representation uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that you uh, cited, Keith. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, uh, by the way, here are all the deal points covered in the study, but we've only included this one uh, uh, excerpt. Um, the study is keyed around uh, a new metric uh, that you should all be aware of. Uh, I called it, we called it buyer power ratio or BPR, but it is very simple. Uh, it's simply the buyer's market cap uh, divided by the size of the deal. And uh, if you have a huge buyer doing a relatively so a small deal, buying a relatively small company, you would expect uh, to get highly buyer favorable terms there because of the negotiating leverage uh, involved. Uh, so you know, if you have uh, a, a buyer uh, with a $150 billion market cap buying a $300 million uh, you know, company, uh, you, know, you, you can do the math and uh, find that it's a buyer power ratio of 500, um, which is very different uh, than a $600 million market cap 
company buying a $300 million company, which is a buyer power ratio of just two. It's very simple. And um, uh, if you look at uh, the 10B5 or full disclosure rep, uh, and you know, Keith boldly said uh, that uh, in only a small percentage of the cases, according to the ABA study, which is, which is based on publicly filed documents, a skewed sample set, uh, do you see this 10B5 rep? Uh, you find out that he's right. This is the ABA study here to the left, the pie chart to the left, uh, that you end up with the buyer favorable outcome, which is, uh, yes, including a 10B5 rep, only about 30% of the time, and about 70% of the time, there is no 10B5 rep at all. Uh, but if you look at the data from this new study, you see that when the buyer power ratio is greater than 200, in our hypothetical acquisition, it's 500. All of a sudden, the statistics skew in the other direction. Um, and you see that an overwhelming majority of the time, there is a 10B5 rep in there. And this is just one deal point that, uh, that we're using for illustration here. Uh, and this bar chart uh, you know, shows it even more clearly. There's a clear correlation uh, between increases in the buyer power ratio and increases in the incidence of buyer favorable terms. Now, our advice to you is not necessarily to use this study uh, because uh, when people throw studies in your face in one direction or the other, that's not negotiation or that's what we call negotiating by the numbers. It's becoming very common here and it's obnoxious, it's annoying, uh, and it's wrong. We all know that every acquisition is unique uh, that you can't look at provisions in a vacuum. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, we yearn for the days uh, of people negotiating by logic uh, and not by statistics. Uh, and, uh, you know, part of the fault here is some of the investment bankers who say, well, once we've negotiated the price, we, we want a market deal, as if there is such a thing as a market deal. Uh, but there isn't. And if you are going to talk about a market deal, then at least talk about the market that you're playing in. And in this case, with the serial acquirers that uh, we tend to represent, uh, it's a very different market uh, than the sample set shown by the uh, ABA study. Some concluding comments, uh, Keith, on this. And by the way, I, I, I should mention, uh, for those of you that are interested in this, um, many of you may not be, but if you find yourself interested in these statistics, and you'd like a copy of the entire study when it comes out, it's going to be released formally in about three or four weeks. It's going to have some impact and some changes in the way uh, the non-price provisions are negotiated, and even some of the price provisions, like uh, or some of the economic provisions. How big is the escrow? Uh, what reps go beyond the escrow? All the stuff that you've negotiated in the past. Uh, just give me your business card. Unfortunately, uh, we're so new at Hogan Lovells uh, that uh, we don't even have business cards <laughs> yet. But uh, um, uh, uh, but. Uh, but just write on the back of your business card, um, uh, new deal point study, and uh, we'll make sure you're on the list and, uh, and get the full study out to you. Keith, any concluding comments? No, just that I'm usually on the buy side, so I'm very happy about this study, notwithstanding I play the sell side on TV. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I believe we have a break now, and uh, um, we'll hang around if there are uh, any questions. And, uh, yeah, um, and Rick, and we, can, we can take a couple of questions now. If, okay, if, sure. If, if, if there are any people that have any observations or questions on anything we've talked about or on any aspect of negotiating M&A deals, we spend our lives doing that. You know, we're M&A lawyers 24-7, so um, there's probably not much we haven't seen in the marketplace, public or private. Hi, have you ever negotiated an unout deal in a public to public case? I know we know of a couple of precedents, but if you want to comment on yeah, those there, structures. There, there, are, there are studies of what happens in the public to public case. The ABA does one uh, a, as well. It's the uh, called the public target. No, he like said earnouts, I think. Earnouts. Yeah, oh, yeah, so oh, those no, are so called contingent, uh, yeah, we have. It's in, there's a lot in the life sciences space called contingent value rights, and sometimes those, those, those CBRs trade separately and sometimes they don't. That's where you see it most often. Yeah, and you see other, uh, in, in the life sciences space, royalty trusts, et cetera. It's very difficult uh, because you have to, you know, sort of hire a, uh, a monitor uh, of, you know, the, you know, have you met the, the, 
uh, the, the bogies and the contingent value, and they tend to be much simpler uh, than the types of complicated earnouts you see in the private company space. And as a practical matter, you just don't see uh, you know, a lot of earnout type arrangements in the public company space uh, because they're flaky. Uh, and a competing bid that's all cash or all stock and that doesn't have a contingent uh, component uh, is usually going to be able to prevail in, in the uh, competitive bidding situation that by definition almost always exists in the public space because unlike in the private space, even when you've signed and announced a deal in the public space, uh, someone can always come in over the top and lob in a topping bid. But again, in the life sciences area, if you have a product that's not yet to market or you've got a new product among others, you need to get value from Yeah, that, I think so. Sanofi Genzyme, for example, is uh, one of the prototypical examples of you know, the equivalent of a relatively simple earnout in that space. Um, uh, other questions or other observations? Great, we'll stick around for the, uh, um, uh, for the break and uh, thank you for your patience. Thanks.